and we're live. Hey. Ladies, ladies and gentle friends, and everyone in between on the you know gender spectrum. <laughs> this is uh, works it out with Papa Fire. Uh, my name is D. A. Carter, aka Papa Fire, and I'm speaking to a fellow identitarian, <laughs> uh, Dr. Peter Rogers, who's a senior lecturer in sociology at Macquarie University, and also the poet Peter Rhodes. They happen to be the same human being who's sitting before me. And uh, Works It Out is a live, unedited discussion where we range from politics to poetry, obviously. So it's like having a beer with you. It's Yeah, except we're having tea right now. Yeah, we're having tea, because we're civilised in the middle of the day. It is very civilised. So welcome to the show. <coughs> Peter, it's a pleasure to have you. Cheers, man. So you've just, re you've just written a pretty powerful uh, article for The Conversation, which I read with interest a few days ago. Having just discovered, because I know you as Peter Rhodes through poetry, that you were in fact Peter Rogers. Yeah, I've been so lying all that time. <laughs> I knew that you were a lecturer <laughs> at, at Macquarie, but I, d I didn't know that, that Peter Rhodes wasn't your actual name. And, and congratulations, as someone who, uh, whose stage name often immediately confuses people. If I say to someone, my name is D.A. Carter, they, they often, it's very bemusing because no, most people don't go by their initials. That's a very strange thing. And so... That actually originated from, um, from me using a different name on Facebook that was preposterous, the, but I kept my initials. And then somebody introduced me to a fellow poet using my Facebook name because they'd never met me um, outside of that context. So I changed the Facebook name to something that was more like a human name instead of the ridiculous one that it was. And I'm not going to tell you what it was. No, that's fine. <laughs> You're allowed to keep secrets. This is a live <laughs> broadcast that <laughs> remains on the internet in perpetuity, as far as I'm aware, or, un or until Google ceases to exist. <laughs> yeah, or until it gets taken down by people who know things. Yeah, which is, which is Google. <laughs> so... That article, which is entitled um, "Is Is the so Is China's Social Credit System Coming to Australia?" Uh, I'll provide a link to that in the description of this episode. Whether you're listening to that uh, in a podcast format or on YouTube or somewhere else, if someone's put it on Vimeo, that wouldn't be me. But anyway, who knows where this thing might end up? But that article, I think, is very prescient. And it really raise, raises a lot of issues with the kind of dystopia that our society could rapidly become or is rapidly becoming. Um, so I want to hear your thoughts on the genesis of that article, what provoked its concerns, and what was the process of writing it like? Well, it's an interesting... I've been in and around surveillance studies for m most of my career as an academic, um, but I haven't been actively writing about specifically surveillance in most of my work because um, the sort of brief potted history is that I started out as an urban studies student got really heavily into the sociology side of, of it got a PhD in town planning and then ended up doing research work on anti-terrorist architecture uh, before coming to Australia to teach criminology off the back of the anti-terror and law links so I've kind of come through that journey to always being around surveillance scholars. And since the thing that got, made me want to get into sociology as a kid was reading 1984 by George Orwell and Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. So I've always been fascinated with the way that creative writers look into the future and try and see both the good and the bad. You know, and it's a lot easier to write the bad. There are a lot more dystopian books out there than there are utopian books out there. But the utopian books end up usually being more terrifying so it's kind of, you know, just I've always been interested in that. But because of that, um, I guess I, am, I look a lot in my work about how security is built into urban space. So I've always looked at CCTV, which is where it started in the 90s when I was studying. And the impact of CCTV on the way that we conceive of, plan for and design urban spaces and look at how laws interact with what it's okay for people to do in those kinds of spaces. You know, is it or where do we set the boundaries of acceptable behavior in a location that is ostensibly public within which you're supposed to be able to do whatever you want within the law? But some things are still on the fringes of that nuisance behaviors. And how, do, how is that changing in a world post 9-11, 20, like when we're rapidly accelerating towards 20 years later and um, the legacy of the changes that have spiraled out of the war on terror 
and other kind of what we call um, uh, uh, securocratic wars, the wars that never end, um, and wars on things instead of against people, uh, that changes the way we think. It changes the fabric of culture. Um, and that's kind of a huge area of interest for me. Well, I think our interests in it uh, collide, as I'm a lawyer, is in my secret life, you know, outside of being yeah, a see, musician. I'm just an academic. You're a lawyer. You're the <laughs> yeah. one to be afraid of. Sure. No, for <laughs> sure. Well, if you're an insurance company, maybe, because my area is personal injury law. Yeah, so. well, yeah, th you're doing good work. Yes, thank you. Um, working for the little guy who's been hurt in a car accident. But anyway, the main... When I was studying, I did a subject called Law, Communi Com Law Communities, Culture and Global Economies, which basically wow. was just like whatever you want to write about or study. And I had a lot of fun with that because I'm as interested in as you... As someone, if you are a creative person, then you're, I think, very open to the ideas of influence by people who are imaginative. And I similarly read 1984 and had a huge impact on me in high school and we studied that and I appreciated that in great detail and Brave New World in particular. But I also, it's funny you mentioned utopias because Aldous Huxley's book, The Island, yes. which is... His utopian book ends with its destruction, essentially. Sorry if that's a spoiler for anyone so who hasn't. They most commonly do. Yes, and when I say the island, I always have to make sure that I insert that it's not the Ewan McGregor film from like the early noughties, which when I they, thought... Please tell I, me they didn't try and translate it into a... No, 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 no. It no, was just mean, a film. You mean the, the one on the, the Thai island off the coast, the, the grown-up version of Lord of the Flies? It was No, no, no. It was just called The Island... And it was I'm one thinking the beach. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, the film that I'm referring to is just called The Island, and it stars Ewan McGregor. And it's about like clones right. that get produced, so like you can have an insurance policy. So if you're like super rich and famous, like Ewan McGregor is, uh, then he has a clone, and the clone Ewan McGregor escapes from this island where all the clones are kept, and like eventually escapes, and meets the real Ewan McGregor. <laughs> And it's a, it's just kind of this disastrously terrible. I think we're a ways off that, yeah. Yeah, that's right. But I just always need to make sure that that's not a transliteration. Different things. Of Dif different. This book di by di the island. Different franchise. This book, yeah, this book by Aldous Huxley. His his utopia, and which is actually a marvelously executed. As someone who uh, has an interest in psychedelics, as someone who is interested in how can communities thrive. All of these uh, concepts are beautifully enshrined in this book. And uh, I don't know. It's clear that Huxley and Orwell had some kind of association and they, they had very different ideas as yes. about, about where we were going. It's really interesting. If you actually look at the, the book uh, Brave New World Revisited by Aldous yep. Huxley, um, a lot of his sort of the, the, the world building that he did around the book, where what he thought was going to happen, a lot of it has actually happened in the last 30 years. It was... Very prescient. Well, arguably, 1984 was used uh, as a handbook. I mean... <laughs> the, the, From the a certain point of view. Yeah, well, the idea that um, if you told George Orwell or Eric Blair, again, another artistic moniker, I mean, George Orwell was a pen name, which is nice to know. But if you told uh, Mr. Orwell back in 1948 that people will unironically use the title of his dystopian vision, like Big Brother. As a TV show. As an unironic peon to this show. And people who have never read the book will use it unironically. And the surveillance aspect of this entire dystopia will be, in fact, celebrated by our culture. And the symbol of the Big Brother show was like a television with an eye inside it. Yeah. And that this will just be part of our capitalist sort of main mainstream Yeah, I've seen similar discussion. logos to that, which ended up being used by that uh, company for the entertainment show uh, on cheap copies of the book that have been produced, so things that aren't a million miles away from it. Yeah. yeah. So I think we both come at this sort of discussion from, if not similar academic backgrounds, because my law studies... It's far more useful. 
<laughs> I just <laughs> my job's really useful. Yeah, no, but I mean, my law studies weren't directed necessarily to <clears throat> critiquing, you know, society. But inevitably, if you're a curious and creative person and you learn about the kind of laws that govern us and what can be done with them, then you become an incredibly cynical person. And this is this is what. Um I think the, uh, the, the conversation article tries to start doing that because it tries to join the dots between things that are relatively far apart, but the, the field of their influence overlaps. And it's in those little edge overlaps on the edges of these kind of phenomenon, these laws, this cultural feeling, this way of designing the location. This is where you start to see the sort of the, the the shape, the scaffolding, what we call an assemblage, starts to take its form out of the interplay and the crossover between these, what might at a glance appear relatively unrelated elements of technology, culture, space, time, being how we move. Um, but the, the, the tools that we use to try and break that down and look at what is emerging from the way these things overlap is where the I think part of this part of the surveillance studies discipline is really looking at that um, reassemblage of new systems out of old systems that lead to emergent properties we weren't expecting. So just to help people who may not have read the article, there are at least three chunks of technology that are being deployed in Darwin that you think might sort of be brought together well not even technology it's a, the there is um the article talks about how the sister cities program um which is a cultural um and economic exchange program that's really about city marketing and place building um, about having cultural and economic and, and even potentially technological exchanges between cities that are of a similar nature uh, how they might both be coastal cities like Darwin and Haiku in China are both coastal cities. They're both port towns. They both have similar elements of industry with a similar kind of tourist, the standard tourist trade. And that, that gives a connection between city officials at those various places to start talking and exchanging information. And all of this seems good, right? This is a good thing. This helps the economy grow. It builds closer ties across international boundaries. This is a cool thing. Then the the next dot that I kind of talk about is how they're um, looking at inspiration of the kind of technologies that are being used and a rhetoric around inspiration of those technologies starts to bleed into Darwin's smart cities program and the smart cities program is a technological uh, innovation program for bringing in all kinds of new greener technologies um, uh, electric buses electric transport having motion sensors on street lights that can turn themselves off if there's no one walking down the road. You can have, uh, to the extent uh, Santander in Spain took this to the extent where they have sensors underneath every parking space in the city that will real-time send information to your GPS telling you where all the free par car parking spaces are with the intention that that can shave five to ten minutes off your commute, therefore lowering CO2 emissions from exhaust fumes in the, in the center because everyone in the city is using it. And when you aggregate that, it turns into a massive saving. Those kinds of technologies are tied to smart city technologies, but equally, CCTV and high-res um, high surveillance technologies are also a part of that fabric. Biometric facial recognition programs being attached to CCTV is also a part of that program. And when you actually look at how that technology has been used in China, over 7 million people in the last few years have been denied access to high-speed rail, to buying plane tickets, because they had engaged in actions that were deemed to be uh, disruptive. For example, writing on the internet um, things, uh, stories that criticize party decisions or certain government officials leads to someone being slapped with a travel ban. Now, I'm not saying that that can happen here, but there are crossovers in the way in which that technology can work and how it bleeds into our law enforcement system. Now, and that's where we start getting the third part of that story, which is the encryption bill in Australia, which is uh, a piece of legislation that was passed um, very quickly with very little discussion on the last day of parliament. By both parties. Yes, by, both uh, by, parties. by partisan uh, support for it. And uh, that, piece of that piece of legislation um, opens the door to putting back doors into communications technology that would allow ASIO, the federal and state police, to access communications without the knowledge of the person. And the, um, 
the way in which those laws are written are highly problematic. Now, when you start meshing that with technology, you know, it's important to then track that back to see how these things are bleeding in. And that's the story that I was trying to tell to raise people's awareness about the issue. Yeah, I think that it's absolutely worth drawing out those dots. Firstly, because a lot of people don't realize that these dots are being drawn, let alone that they can be connected in a frightening way. But also the profound ignorance around something like the Encryption Act. Um, I mean, my father and his friends, for example, are very conservative and they're very old, you know, cons re re relative to us, I guess. They're in their 60s. They didn't grow up in the era of computers. And when you talk about, hey, you know, there's this Encryption Act thing, which basically means that anyone's technology can be compromised and there's a gag order in place if... Uh, the government decides to do that, if the intelligence agencies decide to do that, we'll never find out about it. Would you'll just be sending emails or sending work documents, you know, using software that's been backdoored and anyone can read it without a warrant. And they just don't know what that means. So when people start using phrases like removing oversight from the judicial process, um, when phrases like that start creeping into the description of a law, I get a little, you know, the, the, the social democrat, the, the freedom lover in me starts getting uncomfortable. Oh, the, the lawyer in me starts becoming terrified because the thing is that there are legal processes, you know, the, the process of getting a warrant can sometimes feel like a rubber stamp, but at least there's a paper trail that it occurred and there's a decision that has to be made. I mean, our society has made choices regarding new technologies and who can access the records regarding them. Most people don't know that Opal records can be accessed without warrants. And that can be done. The list of agencies that wanted to apply to access the data that was leaked to the ABC was truly frightening. It was like the RSPCA, Australia Post, just any government or quasi-governmental agency that wants to maybe be able to find out where people are traveling would want to be able to see that stuff. I think obviously the largest discussion around things like that is um, tracking people who are on welfare. Um, Absolutely. Was a, a big part of the discussion. Should the <coughs> should agencies be allowed to? Because obviously the rhetoric around door bludgers in this country is, and then you start getting into a grey area where some people will be like, yeah, give them that power. But when you give that kind of power to an organisation, you open the door for them to use it on everyone not just the people that you might not like or that you think need to be monitored. They, will, they might also use it to monitor you. And yes. that lack of reflexivity when, um, creates, you know, uh, it, um, it empowers that slow function creep of the technology into areas where it was never intended to be used, targeting people that it really shouldn't be targeting. And not just targeting people that it shouldn't be targeting. I, I would argue that with things like the... Um the laws surrounding uh, the fact that ISPs in Australia need to track everybody's browser history for two years. That was, again, passed with bipartisan support, which is, you know, insane. But in a context where ASIO and the federal police, before something, uh, like before the, the Sydney siege, for example, when Man, Man Monis posted on Facebook that he was going to do something crazy that day, there was a tip about it and it was never followed up. And there's also questions about whether he should have been on bail in the first place. Now, in the context where our justice system and intelligence agencies and enforcement agencies can't pick up on actual direct tips that are given on the day that something disastrous is about to occur, and yet they say, you know what would be good? If we had everybody's browser history. It's actually arguable that it's not just that the, the problem is not just about individual liberty. It's about this. These agencies are just seeking huge swathes of power that they clearly couldn't can't exercise effectively now. They're just hoping that, that, that now's the time to get it and we'll figure out how to use it later. Because right, you know, right now it's clear that they're not competent enough and not manned enough to follow up on tips that are given directly and yet they've been giving gigantic swathes of data uh, just in case they want to look at that up in a in a investigation later or just for posterity it'd be great if we can have this stuff now and start to learn how we can use it 
even if we can't possibly see the utility of that now. I think, yeah, well, you're tapping into a couple of really nice um, kind of areas of discussion as well with that, because part of it is about uh, the shift of what government does away from reacting to stimuli, you know, um, to preemptively acting on risk. Uh, is that's a big theme in the way that the relationship between citizen and state is changing. And that's another thing that brings us into the next one in terms of the recognition that can happen through these kinds of technologies and practices and the potential for misrecognition and then the label that are applied to people. And now, are you being recognized as a good law-abiding citizen? Are you being misrecognized as a potential threat? Are you being accurately recognized as a potential threat? A threat to what and whom? You know, and when the way in which the technologies and laws get applied are already spilling over just by the attitude into other aspects of law enforcement. And a good example of that is the way in which uh, the state government dealt with the Martin Place homeless camp in Sydney just not, not, not that long ago. And effectively what they did was to change or to create a law that outlawed what the people were doing after the people had done it to be able to legitimize their removal of those people from that location on the grounds of it was for their own safety. Uh, um, again, both as a child and as an adult, I've never liked people taking that decision out of my hands. I will decide whether or not I'm safe. I will decide where I walk. I will decide if I walk down that dark alley at night because it is my choice. And if something bad happens to me, then I accept that because I took that risk. Yeah. I do that. I go th all over the world. I walk through the slums in Bangkok without fear. You know, and I'm probably okay because I walk within a bubble of privilege as a white male who's quite obviously wealthy. I can go a lot of places in the world and feel safe. But at the same time, I make those decisions. You don't tell me it's for my own good. And you know, the nature of what freedom is, you know, at the heart of democracy, no matter who you talk to, they talk to the hard right-wing liberal. And for the hard right-wing liberal, the core of democracy is individual freedom. And that's what, they, that's what they pursue. And if that is what our society is built around, then these kind of actions start to erode the edges of that freedom. And we start getting into an argument of who are we recognizing as legitimate and where are the boundaries of that legitimacy of a law-abiding, right kind of normal citizen fall into uh, and what kind of boundaries do we start seeing being placed through law and through technology over those locations. I think that's, I mean, that's a great point. The, the misdirection and the, the justification for some of these laws that really restrict freedom being based on security and safety is often just a, a political, it's often just politically expedient. So um, anti-protest laws in New South Wales are one of the strictest in that I've ever encountered it's it's truly astonishing yeah and so several of the uh, those are same anti-protest laws being deemed unconstitutional by the australian mm. high court and are uh, still subject to amendment and potential repeal but a lot of them are still in place that's right and and just the idea that um recently i think a few years ago uh keep sydney open wanted to do a rally uh in king's cross and the police commissioner uh objected to it and they had a they had a sought an injunction and the Supreme Court upheld the police's right to say you can't have a protest because we can't keep you safe because which is extraordinary it's like the police themselves acknowledging that they're not competent to keep people safe at a protest um, which is, and then that's the excuse for the protest not going ahead. And we've seen that in the UK as well. The same rationale was used to be able to uh, justify the police incursion to the Heathrow climate camp in the UK many years ago. And the police went in there uh, saying, we can't guarantee that this camp isn't infiltrated by terrorists and it's so close to the runway. We need to go in at 3 a.m. in the morning with sniffer dogs and flashlights and kick over all the tents and drag everyone out to make sure there aren't any terrorists there. Now, um, that was to protect the protesters, uh, 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 essentially, to protect the protesters from being infiltrated by terrorists, and they made 23 arrests for public affray because people didn't like being woken up 
in the middle of the night by policemen with dogs when they were you know, doing his peaceful protest. And they managed to, at a cost of some million pounds, I think it was about two and a half million pounds with, for the actual operation, disband that camp as a result of that because it was a military or a paramilitary intervention into a peaceful protest on the grounds of safety. No. We once saw uh, two Fathers for Justice climbed the Big Ben in central London as part of a May Day protest and hung a sign on it saying rights for dads. And the uh, chief advisor to the national security at, at that time, I, I forget exactly what the role of the person was, but a high advisor said, if two men can hang climb that and put a sign on it, what's to say someone couldn't climb up there with a phone that was a bomb and blow it up? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so these kind of rhetorics start to spill over, and what you get is this perception of the idea that protest, or at least direct action protest, is potentially dangerous, and that those people who are protesting aren't safe. That spills over into the idea that we need to create laws to stop that, and then what you've actually done is criminalise direct action. Uh, we saw the same thing with, we, uh, at the protests in Manchester when I was out on the streets doing... Um, research on the sec temporary security that had been put around the conference center. Um, we had snipers on roofs. We had 24-hour helicopter surveillance of the uh, cent center of Manchester. We had um, steel barriers uh, eight foot high all around the center with a separate private walkway from the hotel to the uh, barrier for the people who were delegates, prime minister, cabinet, and all of that to walk from the hotel to the conference center. And we were taking pictures of the police, taking pictures of us, taking pictures of the police. Yeah. You know, and and the, the surveillance cycle, it was crazy. You know? well, it's, it's actually interesting and it's fascinating how surveillance in a camera-based society uh, with security cameras being so pervasive can be a double-edged sword. I mean, in my, in my work, we've represented someone who was completely exonerated by CCTV after they were tased by the police. And I read uh, the report of the sergeant, which, you know, was essentially a pack of lies about what this gentleman was doing before he got tased. He was threatening, he was arguing, he was being vicious. And there's just CCC, CCTV footage of Mr. Ali Alcan just walking across the street. This is on YouTube, you can find this. And uh, Sergeant Timothy Devitt tasing him in the back, um, completely unprovoked. And were it not for that CCTV, uh, it would be our client's word against the police. And so having an objective record of events that transpire is, in certain cases, undoubtedly absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. But there's a... <laughs> there's there's definitely a, ver a, a huge disproportionate power that the state can wield in terms of how that information can be utilised and aggregated compared to individual citizens. And that's, th that's where surveillance studies have certainly moved in the last few years. It's moved away from the, 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 the heart of where it started, I think, which really was CCTV in urban space. And now we talk about data. And, or, and what they call, I think the, the buzzword was data valence because of the digital footprint that we leave behind us and who has access to that. I do this with my, my students. I throw them up on one of the slides in the first year lecture, uh, the, the, a, a cut and paste of the box. Tick this box if you're to agree to the terms and conditions. As in, how many of you read them? Now, we all, how many of us have Facebook accounts, Gmail accounts, um, Instagram accounts, Snapchat accounts, Twitter accounts? I mean, we were tweeting just before we went on. And I don't know if I've ever thoroughly read the terms and conditions, and because you, you need to be a lawyer to really understand all of the implications of those things. And I just recently found out that um, Google, for example, uh, there's a facility inside of Google which uh, tracks every purchase that you've made with Google Chrome, stores that information inside your Google account settings, and Google uses that to target the advertising through your accounts better. Now, and that, that was every transaction that I'd made with my credit card through a third without using I think it was PayPal as a blocker every transaction I'd made with my credit card was recorded by Google and I didn't know yeah that n none of this ever shocks me um, effectively I, I mean I am a lawyer and I've never read those things and I, I the kinds of I mean even among 
lawyers, everyday practicing lawyers. There's a special super cadre of psychopaths that actually read and write those types of... I've spoken to one, uh, Mr. Mr. Pat Brown, who's a massive corporate lawyer and a, and a code... He writes code himself. He's the kind of guy that might read. And he uses, like, lava bit and, and you know, email and is just very much on lockdown. Uh, in I, I, in his work life, I think he's a bit more laissez-faire. You know, he still has a Gmail account. But effectively, it's... I My attitude towards it is effectively the mentality that it's like you know going it's just going out in public with no clothes on like that when you're using a machine unless unless you have taken extraordinary steps unless you are you know opsec ready uh to really know your stuff you may as you know you're you're a babe in the woods effectively and here's the, the most of those terms and conditions have ways of structuring uh the ownership of the data that is on display in such a way where you are often signing away your monetary right to own information that passes through that window, uh, be it the, the the browser window or the display of your phone, you're often signing away your ownership and because all of that information has a monetary value. In all of our digital footprint has a monetary value. And when we sign away our ownership of that data, we're signing away our right to be able to profit from it again. I, and, and I know it's not the nicest part, but it seems to me that one of the ways that trying to get people riled up about this, because we've been trying for years, is to appeal to their self-interest. A lot of people, because we are so complicit and we do sign the terms and conditions boxes, but if you say you're losing money, I think that's actually going to get a more of a reaction out of people than, than saying uh, your privacy has been invaded. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's kind of a sad state of affairs, but there is a value to all of this as well, even yeah. beyond the value of freedom or rights. So I think from the intellectual property perspective, my understanding of, of – because I have looked into that aspect of some of these services. And very present online as well. <laughs> Me, myself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, less so these days with the nine-week-old. Yeah, but um, that will happen. Yeah, I've, I've definitely published most of my work online you know to the extent that it's actually got finished <laughs> into a form that i feel is worth sharing but as someone who has definitely taken a look at that at, at the um the uh, terms and conditions and the and all that stuff behind most of those services what is often the case is that they're not trying to claim copyright on the you know the work your words themselves just simply that you they you they don't owe you any money for however however they make money while your stuff is on their servers that's effectively what it boils down to in in much more complicated legalese than than even i want to really get to grips with and to an extent i'm going to defend i'm going to defend some of the social media uh networks here in at least one sense i think that the the way that these that these uh, companies have started their businesses, um, for example, Facebook began you know kind of free and just advertising, and it seemed like the deal from a creator's side of this of the uh, equation was reasonably fair. You could put your work up and share it with an ever growing and very large audience with no gatekeeper. And effectively, the intervention algorithmically at the start of these services was minimal. So it was effectively like kind of a real-time feed of people who you knew and, and you know, if you liked a page that was a, a stranger, people that you didn't know. And, it, you know, the, the extent that likes were a um, thing that helped things get more visible, it seemed like there was some sort of meritocracy to how things spread based on more shares, being liked more, being seen more, and so on. And so it seemed like that was, a fa uh, uh, at the as it was getting started, a reasonably fair way to distribute things because when these things were in their infancy, it was brand new, wonderful to be able to reach people on, say, MySpace uh, and Facebook. If you're an artist or a creator of, of any kind, not to have to pay 
upfront costs, not to have to go through a label, you know, to be able to build up a following just with your talents, ostensibly. As they've professionalized, the deals changed. And this is the thing that I object to, which is that if you're a creator and you were posting things on Facebook, you know, from 2009 or something like that, whenever, you know, years and years ago. Oh God, that was years and years ago. That's right, I know. So <coughs> when, you were, when you were doing that, it, it felt like you had a share in, um, you had a sm however small, you were playing a role in making this service more interesting and potentially imp increasing its popularity because it's full of activity and full of stuff. And then as the years progressed and Facebook decided to, you know, turn on the money tap and that advertising wasn't enough, it was also about owning and controlling data and then also getting money from adverti the advertising side from users and deciding, you know what, hey, the, the, the deal has changed. This is no longer kind of a public square where you can set up your own little shack and will, and you know people can come and go as they please. Actually, we we have structured this mall quite differently now. Yeah, like they began to monetize visibility. That's right. And so, an audience which you, as a creator, can feel like you earned of you know thousands of people who have actively decided that they've they want to engage with your material. Suddenly, you don't have access to that audience anymore. You have access to a tiny fraction of it, and you Unless need to. You pay. Yes, that's right. And so that's the massively objectionable part from my perspective. The idea that that create that creators, big and small, <coughs> contributed to these places, particularly Facebook is the most guilty of this. Um, contributed to contributed to it becoming a popular and exciting place because what they offered initially was exciting and novel and and good. I, I think that it's very hard and I'm, I've, I'm a terribly cynical person, but I think it's hard to look at something like Facebook and remember what the world was like before it, where you could, you, you could easily lose touch with your relatives. And although it seems to be a horrible situation these days because it's so heavily mediated, heavily algorithmified, and we've got 10 years of a culture that seemed to be promoting a, a sort of non-stop performance of your identity and yourself and people are sort of some people are just simply obsessed by how they're perceived on these platforms more than they are just using them as they possibly should have been which is just to connect with people and to share your perspective it's an interesting I, I, like when i look at how i embody myself on these social media platforms as well which is usually my first point of reference and it's just, it's very egotistical i'm aware um, but i look at my own life and my own usage i look at my facebook now and i look at how it's changed and it used to be the stream of consciousness narrative and now it's the stream of news articles yeah because that's more or less uh, interspersed with occasional comments about why i don't watch shows like game of thrones um <laughs> you know so uh, and my Twitter is purely links to academic material, uh, you know, whereas my Instagram is poetry and Dungeons and Dragons content. Um, and it, it wounds me in my soul that my paintings of miniatures for D&D &D get more hits than most of my academic work. But um, at the same time, it's one of the reasons why most people under the age of 30 that you talk to now are relatively comfortable with the idea of being watched all of the time when they move through spaces because they are performing themselves in a digital space regardless of where they are physically and the, that aspect of their lives is as real or more real sometimes in the, the physical movement of their body through space. I read an interesting article that suggested the, the rise in fashion of tracksuits were, um, was because people weren't dressing up to go out to clubs anymore. They were staying home on their computers. Um, I, I thought it was remarkably idiotic at the time, but it, it, it made me smile and it made me think about the way in which micro changes in cultures are potentially knock-on indicators of other threads of change that are happening. And most of the younger people that I talk to and when I talk to my students, um, you have to be very, very careful not to come off as some kind of paranoiac, crank conspiracy theorist when you talk about the worst case scenario. And sometimes we use these things as uh, an opportunity to hold up a mirror. 
and that's what I think like the TV show Black Mirror does for people and one of the reasons that show often gets talked about in these kind of contexts is because it holds up a very ugly mirror to the horror of the mundane and and it shows the everyday world of what could be being accepted and unquestioned by people uh, the episode of that TV show of that show where they had the lens imprinted on the child's eye so the mother could could watch through the eyes and, and see what the kid was doing um, that kind of shows you the, that balance of safety and invasion, you know, and that idea that we're doing this to protect the people that we love, we're doing this to stay safe, but at the same time, it is an invasion. But at the same time, there is a level, there is a threshold at which we are comfortable with that. When that boundary between our fear versus our need, and I think a lot of people in this world feel that risk, where inundated with crime shows we're inundated with bad news on the news we're inundated with either the political theater or the inside baseball of camera that so few of us actually care about and bad news bomb crime murder the sensational and the dramatic which aren't every day but uh, that we know that they're out there but they receive much higher level of attention than good news does in the media um and uh the fear, the moral panic, uh, child pornography, dangerous pornograph, uh, uh, dangerous uh, terrorists, uh, pedophiles on street corners, these things grab hold of people and they make that adds to it, the, the gestalt of it. There's a great book by a guy called Frank Ferrady called The Culture of Fear that tracks this emergence of our fear of the everything. And you put that alongside governments that are afraid to take risks because of a, a sort of a liability culture um, yeah. uh, uh, that is terrified of getting something wrong and of the cost that that might have politically, legally and economically for them to uh, splintering electorates. The, uh, these little pieces of all of these things make it look like things are getting worse and they might not be getting better anytime soon. So... Are we supposed to just knuckle down and get prepared for that? To be as resilient as we can and the strong will survive? Or uh, are we supposed to be so prepared for the worst that we ruin our entire lives waiting for it? Um, you know, uh, are we uh, supposed uh, that that idea that you are prepared and resilient sounds really good until you realize that your buttocks are clenched the entire time? And you can't live that way, yeah. you know? Um, you, you need to be able to relax and enjoy your life or you're going to miss it. You know, it, it'll be over. And um, certainly as parts of my body stop working on their own, um, I'm starting to realize that I need to start doing more before I'm, ra I'm out of time. Um, and I don't know whether or not the, the, there's, there's a kind of a self-awareness pressure point where people realize we've gone too far and um, um, down this road of, of fear and consequences uh, within our culture as well as our legal system and our political representation. But it feels like the water's getting closer to my chin and that, that's, not a, that's kind of a global warming joke, but it's also <laughs> like uh, uh, when, you, when you look at the, ele the results in the election and you realize quite how in the minority you might be, yeah. Um, that also, um, you know, makes you want to try and say, well, if I need, if people don't, if people feel this way, then we need to talk to them. We need to have more conversations because the messages that we're putting out there aren't getting through. And um, if people do want to close themselves off from others, then this the, this visibility thing isn't making things better. You know, if we can see everyone, then we might actually want to talk to them and understand who they are instead of hate them for being near us. Yeah, well, I think the process of even beginning a conversation with someone who disagrees with you uh, must begin by looking up from a phone. And th th those, moments Seeing that they're there. those moments are becoming rarer, I think, for many people. I talk to people that are cons more conservative than me almost daily in the legal field and my colleagues and my parents and... It's less uh, so for me in the academy. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, just the, some of the, you know, casual racism just sometimes shocks me to the, to the core. I work at yeah. Auburn and, um, you know, just di migrants of different stripes will 
attract the 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 kinds of comments from people that I know that are just conservative people that will just make your toes curl. And it's it's such an interesting it's an interesting process as someone who if you want to be progressive and you want to be forward thinking and you see uh, the the trends in in our society that are pervasive, ones where we've got more social isolation, people amping up screen time, spending less time in communities, less time outdoors, less time engaging in physical activity, all of these things which as human beings that evolved in the Fertile Crescent and on the savannas um, are part of our nature, our genetic nature. And when you say things like, new, you know, bad news holds the atten- holds our attention much more, that's again part of human psychology. You know, yeah, we, threat, we, like sort of our threat analysis, our inbuilt... We need. are loss, we are loss averse. Uh, it's, you know, losing things... Uh, this, it's been proved in, you know, so you would know this better than I do, Psych, you know, psychological studies, psychology studies, study after study shows that we value, that we fear losses more than we appreciate gains. And so all of these, un- unless you're the kind of person who who actually is engaged and curious and is reading and then you find these things out and then you sort of say, oh, okay, well, now I have to try and change my own mind. And, and it's almost as if, mindfulness positivity uh is either a chemical imbalance one that i'm i'm a quite a happy person despite being aware acutely of how devastating some of these social trends and and how unjust many of our social political economic systems are around the world and (laughs) acutely aware of how privileged i am in the midst of all of that to be born into an upper middle class family with a good education and the, all the best prospects and you know uh and and being pa- a pale a pale man to boot so it's it's a it's a challenge because as you said b- being down in the dumps about it is not the solution like we we all as individuals and as society we need to appreciate some of the uh, some of the the facts about where we are in western civilization which is that we are, and, and just globally as well, it's one of the most peaceful, prosperous times that's ever occurred in human history. And yet, there's so much suffering. So how is it that we can have things like violence and wars still occurring, yet far, you know, on an ever-declining rate, and we can still feel so bad about all the directions that our society is going in terms of people simply relating to one another um so i it's it's a it's an eternal challenge and i think i do think that this might be an interesting uh inflection point to talk and to shift the conversation towards um the more creative elements of both of our uh, lives because i do think that art provides one of the key answers to to this problem because I find myself being thankful every day that I do have an artistic outlet for my emotions. You know, when something difficult happens, when something ho- horrible happens, uh, whether it's, you know, related to what Annie goes through or something that I go through, having a, a way that you can engage with those emotions and channel them and can transform those the experience of them into something else and honor them and recognize them and feel them and be able to sort of say and ch- take them somewhere and put them somewhere and 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 say okay well that's that's what that felt like and you can put it away if it's become a song or a poem or a drawing or i don't know i don't sculpt but if yeah, some, I've tried. If other people do, I know a sculptor. Yeah, that's a bit of word <laughs> up. That's that's the, that's the that's the hardcore that's that's hardcore art right there. Um, so I'm interested in your perspective uh, as we as we transition from you know talking to Peter Rogers to Peter Rhodes. How do you feel? What what role does art play in helping you personally deal with some of these issues? Because I know that your work um, as Peter Rhodes and in Silent Towns deals very directly 
poetically with the experience, the urban experience, you know, the experience of being in Sydney, dark, cold, wet, windy, isolated. And um, I'm interested in, if you weren't writing poetry, what would you be doing with those feelings? Um, imploding slowly. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm what I call a chronic dabbler. I'm not great at anything, but I'm reasonably good at quite a few things. You know, I'm okay. I'm getting better. But you know, I'm certainly not a master at any of the crafts that I en uh, engage in. Can I just say that you're very excellent at modesty? Uh, that, that's <laughs> cool. That's cool. Yeah, some people call it self-deprecation. Some people call it crippling lack of self-confidence. Uh, it's been branded in a few different ways. But um, yeah, and I feel like... At different stages in my life and my creative journey, I've tried different things, and uh, you know, I've been in bands, but I've never um, been fortunate enough to be naturally gifted at music. So, um, the level of commitment and graft that goes into it, you know, I can dabble with instruments, but I can't really play. Um, I can hold a tune, but I can't really sing. Um, when I came to Sydney, and um, and I did spend the first couple of years here very alone in a huge city on the other side of the world from everyone I'd known, and and I went down a bit of a dark, deep dark hole. And one of the things that helped me claw out of that was discovering the poetry scene and and being invited into it by a group of people who are the most warm, and coming from having spent a lot of time as deeply embedded in goth culture it's not always a welcoming place uh, and it can be very competitive uh, and that might sound unfair but there's a quite a, a high priority um, in how you look and in aesthetics and that can also lead to a little bit of narcissism it's not always a nice collective and there's a lot of great some of my great friends today are goths but um, it, it's not always a healthy place to be when you're not healthy in your own mind and I came into the poetry circuit and was just consumed by the warmth of all of these people that genuinely want you to succeed every time you step up to, to, to share anything. Everyone, poet alike, poets and audience alike, want you to succeed. And that was, that was like a warm breeze lifting me off the ground and um, made my feet never touch the ground again. Um, I really have been given so much support and encouragement by people in this community within Sydney. It's, it's like nothing I've ever known. Um, and so many opportunities have come to me from that, um, that I try now to, uh, to, to keep that door open for as many other people as I can and to spread that, that bubble as, as make it as large as I can, including as many of, of people as well and encouraging other people um, because it's changed who I am fundamentally changed who I am um, from a very uh, uh, sort of dark, inward, misanthropic human to um, a very dark, misanthropic human who performs poetry. <laughs> um, no, I, I have. I've become a lot more optimistic. And it doesn't sound like it given our previous conversation, but I am a lot more optimistic about the, the power of good people to to create spaces where the world is the way we, we dream it. Yeah. Um, and I think poet poetry has that capability, it has that capacity. At the same time, I write with a pen name. Mm. Uh, and I use a pen name to be able to keep those two identities separate. And there was a very conscious decision behind that. You know, um, I'm largely because I wasn't at the time comfortable with, for example, my undergraduate students um, following me on Facebook. Um, at that particular time, I was very deeply enmeshed in that idea that my professional self needs to play a game of recognition and I need to perform that identity in a certain way. Um, obviously, I right now, I'm playing a different role because I have bright green hair. Um, I often dress flamboyantly um, and I represent a particular character in the way that I present myself to the world. But at other times in my life, I have also played a different game where I had short black hair um, that was clipped into a very almost military cut. Uh, I would wear a, a brushed gray suit 
or a tweed suit, a waistcoat and tie, white shirt, or pinstripe shirt, shiny black shoes. And I went to work like that. And I represented that way. You know, I was doing research with government officers and um, um, going to conferences with military and intelligence agencies working around resiliency and security uh, as a researcher in that field. It's a lot easier to deal with people if you um, look like people expect an academic to look. Um, you know, because I know that the the way I the color I dye my hair has absolutely no impact on my capabilities to do credible research. It has absolutely no impact on my ability to stand in front of a crowd and read a poem. But if you go into Canberra, you probably don't want to have bright green hair. If you're going to talk to somebody in the Attorney General's office, it's just not going to go the way you want it. Yeah. And if you want to perform poetry, it doesn't you can, hurt. You can do, you can do it in a in a grey tweed suit, but. Green I have hair, green hair. Yeah, yeah I, and I and I have because sometimes uh, uh, I like to have people perceive me as a twee Englishman, and and it can be fun to play that game. It can also be fun to go up there in a skirt and leopard print tights. Uh, it can be fun to to wear a trench coat and a flat cap and look like a working class vagrant. I can be all of these people because. As I said to you before, as Walt Whitman once said, we contain multitudes. I contain multitudes. I can be all of these things at once. Mm. I can be Peter Rogers and I can be Peter Rhodes. And I can be both of those people. But not everyone that I engage with is going to understand that. And um, I'm more comfortable with it now than I used to be, which is why you're starting to see this bleed of yeah. using both names together and of me doing things like like going and teaching with green hair because I, I just kind of don't care as much as I used to, um, but there will probably be times when I will still play that game. Yeah, I think it's an inevitable thing with, with regards to identities. And if you have multiple one, if you have multiple identities as an artist, as a creative person, ultimately, they're all you, and the people who know you best know that you occupy all these different roles. And so, for my wife Annie. Uh, she's, you know, she knows me as Dave, sees me perform as D.A. Carter with spectacles and then now I've started Papa Fire and she's like, well, that's all the same guy. But other people are profoundly confused um, yeah. now that I have a new name for my art and my music. You have to build some, brand some recognition <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah, I guess. But in a, in a way, I, 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 they're all me. I don't... I don't care that people misunderstand as well because the longer you spend with them, it's 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 different when you kind of when you're creating something new, it it's it's a bit stiff. It's like needs to be worn in, you know. Like you need a it's a new suit of clothes. Yeah, you've it's got like to, a you've got to you've got to soften them. You've got to wash them a couple of times right. before it fits your frame properly. It's you know? a new pair of boots. Um, but also just being comfortable with other people's discomfort around things not making sense is is great. I think it's it's a very strong thing for someone who makes w artwork of any kind that if you're not comprehended, that that's not a problem. You know, that it, that it, it is in one sense it, because everybody wants to be understood. But if, if someone, ha you know, thinking, oh no, that's a weird name or I don't understand. Do I call you Papa? Like, what do I do? You know, it's like, that's the kind of thing that I get now. Right. And it's like, I'm not asking you to, that's not my name. It's just... It's, it's, it's a, a it's representation of yeah, a thing yeah, that I've right. made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, pe people... So Robert Smith and The Cure, for example, it's like The Cure is his band. And he's often, for most people, snot it's like that guy from The Cure and Robert Smith are the same person, you know. But he's synonymous with both. But anyway, it's it's just interesting because it's like a band name. My my identity right now is like so sounds like a band name, but it's just me. Yeah, it's the same with like Silent Towns is basically the same as I do with my poetry, adding the layers of what other wonderful creatives um, allow me to be there while they're making these things, and I read poetry with it. Um, we're doing a, a show soon, which uh, um, at Sounds on Sound, which is going to be largely improv, um, live live audio uh, from analog synths and the like, with poetry woven into it, and that's going to be pretty much entirely improv. Because, as you know, I, I usually read my poetry because I don't practice and I don't memorize, um, so I I have to read it. 
and I'm starting to move away from that into that more improvising live with that domain and then taking pieces of poems and weaving them into a story to be able to um, tell something that is relevant in that moment to those people who are there and create an experience rather than to repeat the same experience over and over again then each experience becomes a new iteration it's like walking down the street every different every day the weather is different and you're going to see different parts of what the city is on any mm. given day because of the cloud cover because of the temperature you're going to feel and see different parts of what it is and i like that because that si notion of silent towns being one a collaboration between creative people two having a strong improvisational element which is very much like everyday life but three telling very human stories um through the the words uh, with a strong emotional resonance from that music. It, it it turns into something that feels like it might be making an art uh, for, for that little moment. Uh, and I really like that. I really do like that about it. You know? yeah. I'd, like to in I'd like to integrate more visuals and have uh, moving visuals. And uh, I'd like to have uh, a gallery space which had a, a small mock-up city built around the stage. I'd like to be able to perform in the round uh, and give other people the opportunity to come in and interact with and improvise with the things that are being made by those musicians if I step out of that space. And I know you would love that because you would be right up there straight away. <laughs> you know, um, and, but the idea that you can create these interactive livescapes that can be a part of a real living space. Um, and some of the, uh, uh, one of my favorite artistic things uh, that I've been able to be a part of is a night in San Francisco called 16th and Mission that they've been running every yeah. Wednesday or Thursday night since the mid 60s without fail and it's uh, uh, literally people gather on the street corners I think yeah I yeah. think there's been I think there's been there's a probably a few yeah. there's probably a few <laughs> but they advertise it that way and, no. and I was able to go down there and be there and I sat and um, for about six or seven hours because uh, just on a street corner and watched yeah. And I, uh, just because I could, uh, I was at a conference doing research and, and talking about urban themes, so it felt appropriate to go to a poetry night. Um, but I watched that area change, and I watched the, the gangs that had been on that street corner all day filter away. And then I watched some homeless people who used that corner as a meeting spot, and some food was distributed. And then they went away. And then about nine o'clock at night, a bunch of poets turn up, drew a massive chalk mandala on the floor, and suddenly it's this rap and music and performance in that space. But there were still elements of all of these other people moving in and around it and interacting with people, and people knew each other, and it turned into this vibrant community space that had utility beyond the fact that it was a train station and a street corner. It had all of these other layers of meaning to the people who live, work, move through, perform in those locations. And that was just lived, and yep. it appears, and then it's gone. And there's something really beautiful about that too, which I really like. So I'm, I like that idea of live art as a performance being something that we can, we can do. It also gives me a chance to get out of my head and interact with people, so I'm very into that. Yeah, those, those kinds of places and spaces you realize are created with a poetry performance space on a street corner in san francisco is made by people and if you have i don't know how many people but it's like a hundredth monkey type environment if you have you probably only need two people to convert a street corner into a poetry experience yeah it's always say it's not the first person who starts dancing that starts the party it's the second that's right yeah. it's the one who dances next to them and then everybody else realizes that it's okay to do that yeah but this feeds back into something we were talking about earlier because those kind of spaces if you look at where that was happening that was happening on a street corner in a marginal space that was paved between the exit from the train station and a fence that led to a car park nobody cared about that location nobody was watching that location there were no cameras on that location privately owned public spaces as shopping malls the walls come down on shopping malls and they spill back out into the streets and you have pedestrianized areas throughout more and more of the city where the primary use of that is as a, like an amenity space for people to get to the shops or to get from their car to the shops 
the boundaries of the acceptable conduct that we'll allow for in those spaces gets narrowed. Now you have to have a permit to be a busker yes. in that location. Yes. Now you have to have a license to put that chalk on the floor. And uh, as you start getting these encroaching regulations and the, the creep of the function of those CT CCTV cameras, of that visibility, of that law and order, of those afraid. Well, a kid might go down into that alleyway and get attacked by someone. Yeah, but there's also Griffin way entirely. And I, I'm, and I feel like the intent is to take all of that creative action and to push it into commercial en environments where it can be recognized as having worth. But not all art is about worth. A lot of art is about expression. And that freedom of expression is a universal human right. And if you start talking about ironing out universal human rights through bureaucracy, we come full circle back to the problems with surveillance and data and technology yeah. uh, being used uncritically. Um, and, you know, uh, a huge amount of art is protest. It is the scream into the gale that says that we can't accept this. Just look at the amount of representation and diversity there is on the poetry scene and the kind of things that are being talked about there. Yeah. I, yeah. I, for a long time, wanted, just as a piss take, to, to try and write like a right wing poem. You know, it's like, <laughs> where, where are the right wing poets? It's like, it's almost a misnomer. The idea, I mean, I suppose yeah, I sp they, must, they must exist. Where oh, yeah, yeah, I guess. Okay. And urban, I, I'm, I'm imagining though, you know, the, the kind of things where poets who, you know, are progressive and left will write about the issues that move them, injustice and refugee issues and issues that, that spark their compassion. And I would just love to hear a poem, you know, like th from the Gina Reinhardt's of the world. I, am, I, no, I no. tell you, there's, a, there's one really good representation of that. It's called The White Man's Burden. It was written by Rudyard Kipling. Right. And it's uh, about the responsibility of white colonial Europe to civilize the rest of the world because it's our responsibility to drag poor tribal people. I've, read, back, I've read that. Yeah. And, and I use that as a great example of what not to do. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, it's a really interesting time capsule that you could probably put that poem in front of some of those conservatives and they would probably respond to it because the, the, the messages in it are the same about um, superiority and uh, all of the same mantras of nonsensical yeah. mantras that we're familiar with. I think what mm. I was getting at in a tongue in cheek way is that often the, the kinds of mentality, the, the mentality that, that wants you to share um, your emotions in a spontaneous way, in an emotional way, in an expressive way, in in this day and age, are contrary to what a lot of people e on the right, you know, it, it's very it's a very rational, you know, a lot uh, most of the reasons that people on the right come up with for not being compassionate and for not supporting the kinds of issues and the kinds of solutions that people favor on the left is because of reasons, you know, not feelings. Mm. And so as a result of that, you know, writing a poem about your arguments. No, they'd probably write a legislative agenda and get it passed through parliament. Oh, yeah. I they know. did that already. Exactly. See, this is, maybe this is the problem, Peter. Maybe, mm. maybe, maybe us poets need to stop, stop, stop oh. toying with our feels and start Picking up Stop the, uh, feeling things and start doing things. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, I don't know that the protest march uh, is gonna is gonna really have much impact in the future, and that's what we tend to do. Whereas, uh, and I think just I wanted to to touch on something you and I have been doing. We've been committing this sin for a while now. We talk about left and right, and um, the, the we should probably acknowledge that what we're actually talking about these days is right and far right. And that the the left is right, right, and writer. <laughs> yeah, um, any any attempt to look at any spread of the political spectrum will show you that um, all of the parties are either close to the left, left, left of center, or very far to the right of it now. And that the Labour Party is my might have, might have a left and a right within the Labour Party. It is dominated very, very strongly in terms of its policy by the right of centre part of that party. And uh, as soon as Anthony Albanese became uh, became leader of that party, the, the newspaper started saying he needed to shed the lefty logo and, and move more to the right with his policies. That, that started on the same day. And he's considered to be a moderate, uh, yeah, which is just right of centre. You've got to... So 
you've got to you've got to shut that Overton window. You know, it gets it gets chilly if it's <laughs> if it's too open. Yeah, <laughs> so there, there isn't really a left and right anymore. There's a right and a far right. Um, uh, the left still exists, but there isn't a political party that accurately represents it these days. No, I I agree. It's um. Yeah. There's a lot of individuals who feel and and individuals who have these views, but they're not represented within the political system. I, and getting, I, I think, to kind of pull things back into the discussion of intentional spaces and what hippies and progressives do with their time, I think, and this has certainly been true of my political um, engagement, is I, compared to when I was, you know, at uni and just out of uni and and in the last in the last five years, I've greatly diminished my uh, reading of media, um, you know, to my detriment probably in terms of how engaged I am with you know what's happening in the world. But also, conversely, to the improvement of my mental health, I definitely feel that reading the papers less definitely made me feel better. As in, because I'm now looking at the world through the prism of my own eyes and I see my beautiful wife, now a beautiful nine-week-old, and um, my friends and the, the community around me, happy and healthy for the most part. And while that seems, while I still am engaged in, um, you know, wor works that I think are good, for example, volunteering for a sound life and performing music for people in hospitals, that stuff is undeniably good. I feel like I'm definitely neglected, you know, activism. I still will turn up to protests like the pill testing protests and so on. But in terms of, you know, being as activist as I once was, I, I'm definitely much less. But on the flip side, the things that I do contribute to, I think uh, creating an alternative space for cultural work and and community might be an abrogation of your respons my responsibility that I feel to you know a broader society on a I don't know or, but I, I, I get where you're coming from I do get where you're coming from because um, there are only so many hours in the day and as you get older your life inevitably fills up with other responsibilities um, becoming a parent is a classic example where it's very very hard not for the world to revolve around this thing that is now in your life right mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and I'm not a parent and I'll acknowledge that I don't understand that um, because for, for reasons that we laugh about off camera um, <laughs> but there are there are a lot of things that fill up your space and your time and you do have to start making judgment calls about where you want to put your time but at the same time I would counter that you become one of the more important um, elements of a culture that is kind that has an open heart because you inspire other people to want to be like that um, and the pair of you are hugely inspirational in my life um oh. when i think that i'm um that i'm not doing enough or i could do more um, um i often look at you guys and realize how little i do to begin with um because you're so active um and it, that's genuinely inspirational and anytime you inspire somebody or want to be a better version of themselves then you're inhabiting the world in the right way um and you know, uh, if we want to make the world what we dream of then the way that we do that is by acting on it ourselves. Nobody's going to do it for us. If we're waiting for other people to make the world a better place for us to live in, we're going to die unhappy. The only way that the world is going to become better is if we take those actions. And we're no longer the, um, the long-haired ponytail at the fringe of the political party. We're at that age where we're the people who need to be engaging. Where we're the people who need to be stepping up and running things. We're the people who need to be taking responsibility yeah. for opening the door for the next generation because if we don't those doors will close and yeah. then there won't be a space for them and and that th the thing about the space you know the, the that i was getting to in terms of you know i feel like i might be abrogating my responsibility um to sort of larger social forces you know on a state federal level but i i feel like in that withdrawal that i've made from reading the national news um the things that I appreciate that I can do and that I do do that create space for the alternative culture that I think is valuable, like 
contributing to Burning Seed and Burning Man, for example, is probably the thing that I feel is most important, like contributing to a culture where even if it's just for a week long period, we can create a space that is a model for being generous, for being engaged, for being switched on to community and land and engagement with other people. These are the things that I think can be truly revolutionary. Small acts of kindness as well. Yeah. I was at a burn event um, a few years ago. It was Saturnalia and it was run by the Canberra Burn crew. And a young man called Jake sat down next to me, Jacob, and sat down next to me and he said, um, oh, so what's been on your mind? You know, what, what's, what's, what's been firing you up recently? I think that's what he said, something like that. <laughs> and this was just after we'd done the vivid uh, human sound project thing yeah, yeah. where we did the like songwriting storytelling in a circle and I was just super fired up about the potential for people to come together and create things spontaneously um, in an environment and I just absolutely unloaded on this on this kid he didn't know what <laughs> I like yeah, when you I have the capacity to do that dude. <laughs> and I remember going on a tirade about you know th this that that um you know what's been on my mind is that burn culture is a revolution in waiting and basically the apolitical nature of this artistic movement is almost like a um it's like a ruse because effectively you have you know uh, tons of people who know how to create an alternative society if the lights go off in civilization you know it's like prepping with actually the good fun bits. For example, you talked earlier about how miserable it would be if you're just getting ruthlessly prepared for the end of the world, you know? How prepared can you possibly be? Well, I think that by going to a burn, <laughs> you're getting more prepared in a better way than anyone who's ever been on doomsday preppers and things. Well, at the very least, you'll be able to build Thunderdome. This is the one I'm talking about, because if you're getting prepped this is the thing that annoys me about Doomsday Preppers is none of them bring disco lights anywhere. <laughs> no, none of them are ready to party. None of them think... No, because the inside... Have you not, did you not know that the inside of every nuclear survival bun bunker is designed... It's locked in. It has to be designed with 1970s interior furniture. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like the law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the thing that, that always devastates me when I see people who have a sort of military mindset when it comes to the end of the world is that if you don't get ready to party, nobody's going to want to hang out in your bunker because the, the, the definition of... You're going to be down here for a long time. Yeah, I want disco lights. Yeah, I want I want like Apocalypso music. Like really, really like pull out the stops. It should be like Apocalypse Now, like popping. Because, and that's the thing that... That's the thing that... <laughs> that's the first time I've used that word used to describe that movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um... Because that's one of the essences of um, burn culture, which is which is fantastic, is that effectively it's like a miniature community, but all the most important things like sanitation and the structure of the society, they're the main things that get organised and that everybody else provides the rest. And you yeah. figure out very quickly, that es essentially what you need for a revolutionary culture is you need a container, like you, needed, you need a... a uh, method to to describe and to understand who's part who's a member and who's not like what there's you need a container like so you need a uh a, 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 a cellular or you know effectively a, a a boundary that defines who's in and who's out and then you need a culture within it because laws are not enough to maintain a actual hab habitual social environment. And this is one of the interesting things about is uh, the burn, I think, is that they don't have laws, they don't have rules, they have principles. Yes. And that those principles are uh, voluntarily adhered to by the people who are a member of that community. But if everybody doesn't voluntarily adhere to them, that community collapses under its own weight because it can't Absolutely. exist unless everybody does. Yeah. Uh, and that, which is why it, it attracts only people who are willing or so far attracts only people who are willing to actually adhere to that because people who don't won't won't make it yeah, yeah. And, and also the 
They, the, well, the we say won't make it. It's not like they're going to disappear <laughs> yeah. into the bush. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. that they're not going to have uh, the experience that they're looking for and they'll look for it at elsewhere at, at, at other music festivals or, yeah. or at music festivals as opposed to at a burn. That's burn-up. right. There's, the thing that I love about the principles is that they overlap and that they require negotiation, that uh, radical inclusion and communal effort means that if you're not pulling your weight, you, that we're going to have a conversation about it, you know? Um, and that self-reliance, radical self-reliance, means that I'm not going to tolerate someone who's a freeloader. Well, that's also something that I think that we've lost a little bit of in our own culture. You know, when we talk about what is it that makes it possible for these incremental changes to slowly shift and tip us into a different configuration for what our culture is that might not be what we thought it was. Uh, And a lot of that is tied to how we interact with each other. Uh, and people don't uh, and I remember an old lady on the train yelling at a bunch of kids who had sharpies out and were drawing on the windows and after she stood up and yelled at them and told them it wasn't okay to do that everyone on the car gave her a round of applause because nobody was willing to tell the kids you know they were they were so afraid that if they interacted with the kids they would end up getting in trouble that nobody actually uh took on that disciplinary role which is so different for when I was a kid I've been dragged back to my mom's house by the ear by people who lived in our village who've yeah. like physically dragged me against my will back there in some pain because I was being a terrible terrible child and uh, I mean that might have only happened once or twice in my entire life but that was okay and my folks said thank you mm. uh, I don't think that would happen now and today I don't think that would happen yeah. today I think I, I've had a a kid try and throw a stick through the front wheel of my bike while I was riding like a, like a metal bar or like 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 a thing. It yeah. clattered. I don't know what it was. Just throw it through the wheel of my bicycle Jeez. while I'm riding, standing next to his dad outside a cafe. When I got off my bike and went back and said, "Did you just see that? Did you see what the kid did?" He told me to get bent and started being physically threatening towards yeah, me yeah. without even acknowledging that the child was at fault because I, I'm a stranger, this is my family, they come first to hell with you. And that was like, well, actually, that was really dangerous and I'm another citizen in this community. Yeah. We should be able to talk about this without it descending into threats of violence or name-calling or posturing and bravado. This is two citizens trying to have a discussion about a child misbehaving. Um, um, but we've become this kind of like there, there are elements of this sort of familial provincialism where we're, we only defend our own but we're in this together Absolutely. we're all in this together even if we do disagree even if our political viewpoints are diametrically opposed we're all still citizens of a globe uh, we're all still residents of Australia we're all still people who are in this community in this suburb of Sydney and we should be able to talk to each other. Um, you know, um, I'm glad that I know the names of some of the guys who ask for cigarettes outside the IGA in my local community, that when I see them, they say good morning. I say good morning because visibility and recognition are human needs, you know. And yes, we whilst we don't necessarily always want to be watched by an invisible eye, we do want to be watched by each other because that's part of the performance of our identity but it's also part of belonging in a community and be it a community of poets or the suburb that you live you want to know the name of more than one person who lives on your street you know i wish i knew the name of the old lady who compliments me on my garden when i'm out there pulling like pulling out weeds and stuff she always does it without fail every time she walks past and i'm in the garden we have a little chat about the flowers and that's a community and I've not had that anywhere else since I lived in the countryside villages of England, you know. Um, yeah. And that's why I love where I live now. Because mm. there is a community there. Uh, and it is, like, slowly over six years of living there, I've got to know some of them. Uh, but that's also, I would say, also that's an intentional thing where right down to the, desi- the design of a house and the design of a front yard influences whether or not you're capable of engaging with your neighbours. Uh, our house here, we have a nice low fence with succulents at the front and we're able to make eye contact with people who go past and we've had lovely encounters with people. The other thing that stuns me about this area <laughs> in the eastern suburbs of Sydney is 
is how often I'll be walking past someone and I'll say hello and get nothing back. Yeah, you get the you get the like the the kind of flash of panic and the icy stare. It's amazing. Or you just get the complete lack of response yeah yeah no tr- complete ghosting is actually the most common i'd say like two-thirds and i'm never sure if they've just pretended if they didn't hear me or if they yeah. like uh, like they're probably talking to somebody else maybe he's got headphones and he's talking on the phone i don't know i get i get thrown off by that all the time uh, just i i find it astonishing because whether or not you have headphones in or i i i offer i offer people no excuses i mean whether you've got headphones in or not you can see that someone's like looked at you and opened their mouth yeah and it's like if you don't care, you know, that's fine. I'm going to judge you though. Um, <laughs> and I'm, and I'm going to, and, and I'm going to conclude that when the apocalypse arrives, you're not getting that. You're not getting wa- on my boat. Water tank. I got, yeah. wa- I got a water tank here. It's like, let's go. That's, that's mine, baby. Yeah. Well, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rhodes, that might be, you know, with all this discussion of the apocalypse, we will uh, never end. We, we, we will sit here forever and talk. If somebody will, doesn't yeah, physically right. stop us. That's right. That's right. And so, I'm going to preempt that because I'm getting a little chilly in this garage and you have not eaten your... I haven't. I've been talking too much to eat my muffin. Yeah. Uh, this is one of uh, Mama Smoke's cakes as well, so I'm eating the hell out of that. Yeah. I, I, you know, it ain't making it out of the garage alive. So I want to thank you so much for being on the show. I don't think this is going to be our last chat on Works It Out, by the way. We've worked, we've worked a few things out. And I don't know. I th- I've got a sneaking suspicion we've just created more problems, but um, <laughs> you know, I'm fine with that too. Well, thank you very much for for uh, coming on this show, and uh, let me bid you adieu. Thank you. See you next time. Say oh yeah. By the, the way, you can yeah yeah yeah. Um, you can find Mr. Rogers. You can look him up uh, on the Macquarie University page. I'll have links to all his stuff, and also Peter Rhodes poet poems on po- Facebook, Instagram. I mean, I'm on all the I'm on all the things, and there'll be links to all of that in the show notes. Thanks See for having soon. me, man.